she probably uh, is, well, is born in Portugal. She spent some time in, in Spain. Uh, she studied in the UK uh, and in the US. And she is uh, now a researcher in France in the CNRS. And uh, she's working on, on um, biodiversity um, geographical indicators and, and uh, organization. So uh, the floor is yours. Thank you very much. Um, thank you all for being here. I would like also to thank the University of London and the Lambassade Francaise, the French Embassy, for the invitation opportunity to be here. Um, just as a, as a start, I'll, I'll uh, explain who, who I work for. I, I work for the CNRS, the National Center for Scientific Research. It's the uh, largest fundamental uh, research uh, organization in Europe uh, with uh, over 11,000 researchers. It's, it's, uh, it's a great job, if you are looking for uh, <laughs> It's one of the best kept secrets in, in Europe. It's a great place to work. Um, within the CNRS, I work uh, particularly for uh, a lab which is called the CEF, which is the Center for Functional and Evolutionary Ecology. It's the biggest ecology lab in France. It's in Montpellier. It's a great place to live. Um, <laughs> and it has about, about uh, 100 uh, researchers. It's, it's um, in a privilege. I've been there for over uh, almost six years. And having lived both in England and in France, uh, I have the privilege of uh, having enjoyed both very much. <laughs> Both. Okay. Very, very welcoming. So today uh, I'm going to start on this, this two uh, uh, voice discussion that we're going to have here. We're going to talk about going beyond my first indicators. And, and before, before going into, into what, beyond what, what are these indicators, I'm going to give you a little bit of context uh, on where these indicators come from. Uh, some of you have been at the workshop uh, this afternoon. You're going to have heard about some of these already. I'm going to go into a little bit more of that. Um, so th this, these indicators, they actually kind of flourish within the context of, of this, something which is reasonably new, which is this concept of global biodiversity targets. So in 2002, there was a, a, a summit of uh, the World on Sustainable Development in Johannesburg, and the, the governments of the world agreed for the first time on some target for conservation, some global vision for for conservation. And they agreed on what was called the 2010 biodiversity target. It was the first time that we had something like this. And the target was phrased exactly <coughs> like in these words. We commit to a significant reduction in the current rate of loss of biodiversity, abolished biodiversity at global, regional, and national level. So here we had something that governments had committed to do. And this set scientists on a frenzy because there was something to measure. Um, and Papers came left and right, and we have in the room some of the people who uh, uh, pioneered this idea because there was a political target, and yet we didn't have anything to measure it. As in, there was a, we had to measure if there was a significant decline in the rate of biodiversity loss. How do you measure biodiversity? How do you measure biodiversity loss? How do you measure rates? So you needed things over time. You need, so there was a flurry of, of, of papers, but more importantly, there was a flurry of indicators, of ideas of how you could measure this target. Because if you couldn't measure it, how did you know if you had achieved it? So this was actually a great catalyst for research where people can put their heads together to try to, to come up with ways of measuring biodiversity and measuring biodiversity trends over time. Um, I'll tell you the, the, the past 2010, so you know kind of like what happened there. Um, a paper in 2010 which uh, synthesized all of these of the targets, all of the indicators that had been compiled and put them together, came up with bad news. It's all going down. We failed. So we failed to reduce the rate of biodiversity loss by 2010. Luckily, the governments of the world did not get discouraged and immediately proposed a new target. And this one is phrased in actually a much more precise and ambitious way. Uh, as part of the current ongoing strategic plan for biodiversity for 2020. And within this, through this, this plan, there are several targets uh, covering different aspects of biodiversity in relation with uh, people with biodiversity. And of particular interest to, to, to me here, to Robin, is target 12, which is uh, the commitment that by 2020, 
we will um, prevent the extinction of non-threatened species. Um, and then we will improve the, uh, the, the conservation status, and particularly those which are declining the most. So this is much more substantial in the sense of talking about avoiding extinctions, we were talking about population abundance of species that we want to reverse uh, declines of, of, uh, of this abundance. So the same type of indicators that had been proposed before are coming to, into play, but with a much more precise uh, um, target. We are now in the middle of this, what has been called the decade for biodiversity, on biodiversity by the United Nations. It may well be a major opportunity we have to try to get some action, so to get some, some decisions together of how to actually go about and, and, and try to, to reduce biodiversity loss at the global scale. So, in this debate, <laughs> um, I'll present first, well, uh, after this, and then we'll discuss. No, we all discuss. Uh, we're going we're to take kind of two different perspectives, but complementary, as you might imagine. I'm going to be focusing on the past, um, on, the, on the argument that we need to, to have better context. We have all these measures, kind of things going down. And I'm going to argue that these, these measures are not very useful unless you can have them contextualized in some way. And that there is no way we can keep measuring as much as we want. But if we don't understand exactly what these indicators are telling us about uh, our impact on biodiversity as well as our capacity to reverse these impacts, they're pretty much useless. They're just, you know, another line of uh, Robin, is going to argue. I'll let you do the argument afterwards, that actually the past is all very well, but we actually need is to look into the future and how can we predict uh, better ways of, of uh, using these indicators to influence um, uh, policy. So I'll start with, with um, there's two indicators that, that uh, are particularly interesting to us, one measuring population trends and the other one measuring uh, um, extinction risk. And I will, I will use these two uh, and explain a bit more about, about each one of them just as an anchor for, for the, the points I'm about to make. So one of these, of these indicators, uh, the Living Planet Index, is just out of the oven, as in a couple of weeks ago. Uh, we launched everywhere, in, even in France, we were talking about this. <laughs> <laughs> no, it was all over, all over the, the newspaper, the radio, because people actually could understand what, what it was saying. And so this indicator, which uses uh, 1970 as a population baseline, and it's measuring an aggregated trend in species abundances. Um, an impressive <laughs> data set of uh, over 10,000 populations covering more than 3,000 species. So the, the, the take-home message that there's been a decline of more than 50% in these 40 years, which kind of means, well, not kind of, which means that the first rate species populations across the globe are by about half of what it used to be 40 years ago. This is so impressive and so intuitive that even journalists were getting it and they were talking about it. And so it's a good congratulations. It's wonderful line of the round. So the point I wanted to draw your attention to is to this kind of 1970 baseline. And the importance, it might seem like, it, well, it's probably where well, data started, so it's easy. Well, there's all sorts of good reasons to start with data science. But I wanted to, to bring to you the, 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 the point that actually this baseline is not just the, a convenient thing, but actually affects a lot the way we perceive these trends and how we try to do something about them. So the, the, the living planet index is anchored on 97. But now think about any, let's abstract into any index. We have a line going down of biodiversity over time. And we, we have some baseline. And I just wanted to bring to you the point that it makes a difference where we put this baseline, even just conceptually. And the reason why it makes a difference is because this distance between these trends, this thing we're observing, biodiversity going down, and whatever this baseline is in terms of either what we want to achieve or where we think we've started in terms of human impact, it makes a big difference to how we perceive the, how we perceive uh, what this trend means, if this trend is, is it a decline of 50% or is it a decline of 10%, it changes the magnitude of the trend, but it also changes what we, how we see uh, our relationship between this decline and what we want to achieve and what we think it should be. And so what does this baseline actually mean? And my point, criticism, is that people have been using these indicators without actually 
actually making much of, um, I mean, these baselines there is if everyone thought it was an obvious thing, but in fact it makes a big difference. There hasn't been a proper discussion of what this baseline actually means. And it can mean uh, two possible things. Is it that it, it's the expected trend if we, didn't, if we weren't messing up with biodiversity, if biodiversity wasn't declining, this is what we would expect? And you could say in terms of population, on average, um, or in terms of extinction risk, which I'll talk a little bit about later. Uh, yes, it's kind of, if we would assume that if we weren't doing things in, in a nasty way to nature, things on average should kind of be more or less stable. Um, so maybe it is what we would expect in the absence of human action. If that's the case, then that, that area there in, uh, in, um, in uh, shaded, well, actually, it's actually a measure of human impact. And so you see the bigger the, 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 more, the, bigger the distance, the bigger the, the extent of human impact. If we start in 1970 and say that is the measure of our impact, we're absolutely enormously underestimating the impact we have on these populations already. They haven't declined by 50%, they have declined by much, much more. On the other hand, it could be not a measure of a pristine world, but the measure of what we aim to achieve. Is it a measure of what, when will we be satisfied? Uh, when will we be happy if the indicator kind of goes up? Is it when we say, good job, we've done it? If that's the case, if it's a measure of desirable state, then the, the shaded area tells us how far we are from success, from conservation success. And again, you can see the importance of this baseline, because if we make it too low, we're being under, um, uh, we're not trying too hard. If we make it too far, we might never get there. Um, but the point is, I've never seen a discussion of this on the European Index, uh, and, and it's a very important uh, discussion to have. We had this, this discussion in the workshop today, where people have, where, uh, people have argued whether it should be more uh, one or the other. Everybody agrees that we can't necessarily go back, well, we can't go back to a pristine world. I still think that both of these, these aspects of the baseline are important. The, the, the historical kind of firmly anchored on something which is about the abundance of species without human intervention, however measured. It's important so that we don't lose track of how things might have been and how things might still be in some cases. Um, on the other hand, we need to understand what is a desirable state for conservation, but this needs a big discussion. What, when will we be satisfied? When is enough? When is conservation enough? And this discussion has not been sufficiently developed. I'm going to go into a particular species just to, to show you an example of, in practice, how, how this uh, uh, So for example, take the southern right whale. It's a species that, if you look at its, its recent trends, and recent here, it's not 97, we're talking about 18, 18. If you look at it in, in this perspective, it's an amazing success story. And it, this is a success, success story because this species is only doing this well because there was active uh, conservation. There was a moratorium on whaling of this species. Uh, you see like a little dip there was illegal whaling by, by the Soviets. So it, it's definitely there because of conservation. So it's an amazing success, success story. The population has increased tenfold in this past uh, century. So if you put the baseline on um, 1880, it has, it's definitely a species which is going up. But it's a species which, um, which comes from a long distance, and then it's original about pre-whaling estimate population is actually uh, much, much bigger. And if you see it from that perspective, if the baseline is this potential pre-whaling population around uh, 1770, then it's actually not so much yet a success story. It's a species which has declined by 87% since its historical baseline. So you can see how this baseline affects the perception we have about, about trends. This is just about a particular species, but when you aggregate it into an indicator, which makes a nice curve, and just on the species, Anymore. You kind of you lose track that these things actually change our perception. Uh, I'm just trying to be controversial. <laughs> it's a debate. <laughs> so, so you can see how it affects our perception of is it good, is it going well, is it not going well. I want to also to, want to point out to you that it's not just that it affects the, it's not just it affects the, the position of this curve. It actually affects enormously. It can affect. And in the case of the LPI, it definitely does. It affects the, the, the curve itself. So I'm going to show 
show to you how, by the fact that you define different baselines, you end up with different curves. And here's just like a little tiny example. Imagine species B doing that, species A doing that. It's just a, just a little kind of cartoon. If you set your baseline at 1950, that's how the red list index would look like. So generally going down, kind of stabilizing around, around towards the end. So you would say for the baseline at 1950, biodiversity has gone, has gone down, 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 has stabilized at, at a low level. But if you had used exactly the same data set and started your, your, your uh, baseline at 1970, you would find an indicator which says that actually we've already recovered the losses. We're doing, you know, we might have achieved this success. We actually already have uh, recovered from a 40% decline. And if we started even later, uh, 1990, well, we're just going just amazing by the rest of just going through the roof. So the same data set, just same indicator, same measure. Why does this work? It's because of percentages. So percentages are in relation to the origi original. And so if we go back to the whale again, if we do it from 97 to 2010, it has increased by uh, a thousand and fold increase. So this, this population, if you, and I assume you probably have it because it's available data, uh, this population is contributing to the red list index by <coughs> Uh, a thousand percent. Uh, while if you were making your baseline starting much earlier, it would actually be contributing as a negative, as a, as a decline and not as an increase. Okay, so this is not just a problem of the LP. This is also a problem of the red list uh, index, which is a different type of indicator, different philosophy. So the, the, the way it works is that it, um, it builds from the data collected by the IUCN uh, red list uh, uh, threatened species, and it's an aggregated measure of species conservation targets, uh, conservation states. So the red list, you might be familiar with, has a set of categories uh, of increasing um, extinction risk from least concern, etc., etc., up to extinct, then you really have a high extinction risk. So you, you have these categories, and what the red list index does is just tracking species as they go up and down these categories over time. So if you have a species which has uh, but from endangered to critically endangered, that's an acceleration in its loss because the species which is endangered is already going down. And if it goes critical, it goes down like this. So you see it's an acceleration in its rate of decline. While a species which moves down as it goes towards least, least threatened, it's a species whose rate <coughs> might still be declining, its rate of decline is reducing. So the red list indicator aggregates these movements. So, for example, for birds, uh, it, it has looked between 1988 and 2008 across over 10,000 species. There were, uh, in this period, 233 species which changed category for legitimate reasons, of which 204 deteriorated and 29 improved. So once you kind of crunch these numbers you take into account, it, it goes down. Same for mammals, same for amphibians, amphibians goes, goes even, even faster. So, it's a, this, so basically, birds, mammals, and amphibians are becoming, as a group, progressively more threatened, progressively closer to extinction as a group. Now, the red list has an advantage in uh, the red list index has an advantage in relation to the LPI, which is there is some kind of it's an absolute measure. As in, if you measure, it doesn't matter when you measure it. If you have a set of species with a set of IUCN categories, you get the same value no matter where, where you started. Because it, there's a, it's anchored on a, a reality, which is it's, not, it's one for if all species are least concerned. So if all species are non-threatening, the red list indicator is one. And if all species are extinct, then it's, it's zero. So it's anchored on these two physical realities, so to speak. But it's not actually that simple, because when it says all species, what all species are we talking about? And in fact, the red list index is, is anchored in 1500. It's the year zero for the red list, as in it's the year at which we start list species which have become extinct. So for example, it will have the dodo, but it won't have the mammals because they got extinct before uh, 1500. Um, so the red list indicator, actually for birds, it works with about uh, 10,000 species, which is the number of species which are in the alive today or plus the 200 something which got extinct in the past 500 years. But 
but in fact, if we had, if, if, was, if the red list index was anchored further into the past, it would not necessarily give the same result because, for example, we know that um, <coughs> we know that there were at least a thousand species of birds which got extinct with the Polynesian expansion into into the Pacific, and that was about. Uh, uh, 2,000, 3,000, 4,000 years ago as, as people expanded into these islands that had no predators and there was a massive, uh, uh, usually not known of, uh, loss of, of species which were flightless birds uh, that, that uh, most of the in places like whales uh, similar to this one. So if we, instead of having started in, in 1500, they had started in two, year 2000 before Christ, then the, the, the indicator was the, the, the baseline would be higher. So, although the red list index has this kind of absolute baseline, it itself is not absolute, it's relative to the starting point. It's, there's more to it. The, the red list uh, suffers from uh, short memory, uh, also known as kind of shifting baseline. Get back, back to our web, so you see that kind of it's, um, it's trained over time. Um, so the red list uh, has categories to evaluate if species are in risk of extinction or not. These categories respond a lot to trends, and they respond a lot when the populations become very small, they respond also to small populations, because they are particularly at risk. So if we had used these categories of the, of the, on this, this trend, nobody was doing red listing yet in 1830, but if they were, they, people would have, uh, would have concluded that um, the species would have been critically endangered at this period when it's declining very fast. The decline is done, so you see there, the, the criteria would be uh, more than 90% uh, decline in three generations, which for this species is about 90 years. So it's, it's a rate of decline proportional to its, its life cycle, or less than 50 mature individuals. So the species would have been classified critically, uh, critically endangered around there. It would have been classified as endangered uh, around there because of very small numbers, basically. And then it would have been classified as vulnerable at the beginning of the decline, before the decline got too, too steep. And then uh, towards the end, as it started to recover, but it still had very small numbers of individuals, the maturity that was less than a thousand. But in fact, today, the, this species is considered the least concern, as it was uh, before it started, it started crashing. And this is because it is a, a fact, the species is, is recovering, the species is, there's no, there's nothing making us think this species is about to go extinct because it has a, it's stabilized, in, in fact it's even increasing, so the species has, has no risk for extinct, of extinction as per se. The red list is basically a flag for things that are going down. But you see it has, it's, it's considered least concern at the population level which is uh, very similar to when it was considered critically endangered. So the red list has this short memory in the sense that if a population crashes down and stabilizes, the species can become again least concerned. So you can see how the red list indicator can have a shifting baseline problem where even if everything comes tumbling down, as long as they don't become too rare, if they stabilize again, you can have a red list indicator that's going up despite the fact that the populations are not going up. The populations might have just stabilized at the moment. So, um, both of these indicators definitely need uh, some kind of discussion on what they mean in terms of the baseline and what we're trying to achieve. And either these indicators or adaptations of these indicators are needed where we do take these baselines into account. Another thing I wanted to kind of point out. So, so in, in 2010, this paper came out that crushed all the dreams of the governments of the world that thought we were about to meet the 2010 target. Uh, and uh, by concluding that, we haven't. So it, it had compiled a bunch of, of indicators into a measure of state, so that's the first graph there is measure of state of biodiversity, uh, compiled over several indicators, it's kind of like going down. But it also had indicators of response, like for example, percentage of protected areas. And this is kind of like, so biodiversity is going down, despite the fact that we're trying harder and harder, I mean, we're, we're, we're doing more and more, and yet we are not, we're failing to get uh, biodiversity the time to stop. So, does it mean that, that conservation is kind of worthless? Does it mean that it's you know, not, we're just not, it's, it's, there's no point, we keep trying, protect the areas and so on, and biodiversity keeps going up. And in fact, uh, no, the problem is that uh, conservation is not enough 
to offset the pressures on biodiversity, which things like habitat loss, etc., which are going faster than our conservation efforts can offset them. So back to our kind of conceptual thing. We have a, a trend, we have a baseline. Um, we could say, well, biodiversity is going down, therefore conservation is not working. No, what we need to look at is what would have happened if we didn't have conservation. So even if it's going down, it could have been worse, much worse, slightly worse, a bit worse, I don't know. It, could have been, it would have been for sure worse if we hadn't had conservation. And it's the difference between these two things, between the trend that we have observed, the Living Planet Index, and the trend we would have observed if we hadn't had for conservation. That is a measure of, of our conservation impact of, hey, for making a difference. We had a bit of a discussion in this workshop on how do we measure this? How can we, uh, how do we know if, if conservation is making a difference? Because this other world where conservation wouldn't have happened doesn't exist. We can't just compare. So we have to make some inference. And there's different methods. Uh, one could be we compare things before and after conservation. And it's relatively easy, kind of simple models. For example, this species, the black robin, uh, it's almost completely disappeared. So there were only seven individuals. And then uh, conservation came in with all of its tools and uh, plants locations and sedimentary feeding, cross-fostering, and just applied everything it could. And it worked. And the species has um, recovered. Well, it's still a tiny population. Um, but still, in, here you can see, okay, that's the impact of conservation. That's the difference between what well, the problem we've gone extinct and what we have today, that's the impact of conservation. So this before and after conservation can be one way of measuring it. Often it's, it's, not, it's not possible. Another option is to, to look inside and outside of areas where we have, where we have conservation. This is a, uh, the result of a study which has looked at uh, the living planet index for populations of, of African mammals inside protected areas. And you see kind of come, population comes crashing down, we're inside protected areas, and we have about 60% decline in population. How depressing does it get? It means that species are not, are not safe even within protected areas. But of course what we don't know is what's happening outside protected areas. And, and it would have been much more informative if we could have had this, this indicator compared to the population trends outside protected areas as well. Um, and then another possible way of looking at this though, is to think about a counterfactual scenario. It's like a, a thought process of what would have happened if in the absence of conservation. And the, a study I participated on tried to do this for the number, using as, as part of this measure, the number of living birds. And um, so if you look at the, the number of birds that have gone extinct, um, or possibly gone extinct in the past in the past uh, 500 years. That's kind of how it accumulates with about uh, 250 birds. And then, if you look at the species that actually we have prevented them from going extinct, this is it's just a subset of the species that we see conservation actions. But it's for once those for the for which we're sure we made a difference, including the black robin that I mentioned before. You see that there's this little kind of cat. There's some which only exist in captivity, and some which are still which are in the wild, usually in small populations. So if you use this this um, information to create the that kind of that graph, so you expect you would expect a number of species to be stable if we didn't have human impact. This is this is the number of, of birds as it declined because of those extinctions up there. So and this is what we would have had if we had not had conservation that prevented this extinction. So we can see that we have a measure of the human impact on the numbers of living birds in the world, and we have this little thing, and it's just a little slice, but we're making a difference. So this is an example of how we can use a counterfactual scenario, going basically going to the thought process of what would have happened if we hadn't had conservation, and try to, to project what an indicator, in this case, the, the the number of, of extinct of living birds, it could have been the reference indicator, it could have been the about the index to try to, to assess how we could um, have had it. Just uh, as a last uh, example, that's another another study which has done this, has looked at so the red list index that I already mentioned, it's in it's in uh, black, that's what happened, and in red is what it would have happened. So there's a set of species you see. 
here we have, for example, for amphibians, we have 450 species that have changed that risk, that were the driving the change in weather indicator, of which 452 went down. And four have improved. And 22 mammals improved, 29 mammals, 29 birds improved. So people went through these through these species that have improved in their status and evaluated if that improvement was because of conservation. And for the species that were considered to have improved because of conservation, we've calculated an alternative, what would the red list index have been if these species had not improved because of conservation. And that's what the difference you see there. So you see that for birds, we're making a difference. For mammals, we're making a difference. For amphibians, we're not yet making a difference. And I count on you. There's a few of you here already working at amphibians. And it's, we have to make a difference, because these ones are going out very fast. So to finish, um, my uh, thesis here is that we need to go beyond having just pretty lines on map how much journalists might like enjoy them. Um, <laughs> and we need to place these, these indicators in context. A fundamental context is we need to think about this baseline. What are we measuring these trends against? And what does this baseline mean? And then uh, we also need to think about what would this trend look like if we hadn't had uh, conservation, so that we have a measure of conservation impact. And I spoke for a long time, and I pass on to in Oxford, then in the Microsoft Research Institute in Cambridge, and then he has um, a postdoc in, in, in UCL. So, we have the floor for... Uh, okay. uh, so, thank you, Anna. Um, the, I, think, I think a lot of what Anna said is correct, but I think that it may not matter. I think <laughs> <laughs> what I'm going to try, I'm going to, I'm going to be, it's not, well, I don't have that many slides, I'll go through them, but the, the basic thesis I'm going to make is that if I give you one dollar to spend on conservation and ask you whether you want to spend it on better understanding baseline or an understanding of what's happening in the future, I think all of you should spend it on what's happening in the future. I think we should make predictions about what biodiversity is going to do in the future such that we can make actionable, we take action against those predictions to best mitigate against biodiversity loss. That, that's the thesis. And I think that, in many cases I agree, it would be great to better understand baselines, and that's almost an academic exercise. But that, <laughs> but that the overall trends that we have for tens of thousands of species are that they're declining, are that they're going extinct, are that their threat statuses are increasing. And those are where we need to make the judgments, the predictions, mm -hmm. the reactions. So as, as Anna was saying, um, the Living Planet Index is one of the data sets that we use to measure uh, the changing state of biodiversity globally. The Living Planet Report 2014 came out a couple of weeks ago, and we made some changes to the way that index is presented to better account for what we think is the diversity of species globally. And we find that across over 10,000 populations of over 3,000 species, we think that the average abundance of those species is declining by 52%. And this, this is the global statistic, but it's, it's, it's much worse in some, in some situations. Fresh water in green, for example, is declining by 76%. In the marine and terrestrial uh, realms, we think that those declines are about 39%. And we have looked across those species and found that the threats to those species tend to be down to things like habitat loss and habitat uh, degradation and exploitation compose the majority of the threats to those populations. And I would argue that what we need to do now is to develop methods to understand how these threats are causing these population changes, such that we can identify those areas of Earth where we can take action to reduce those threats, such that we can save the species that are gradually and this isn't just 
statistics from the uh, index, the red list, uh, which has like over 75 or just under 75,000 assessments now, is also being to these uh, trends. So, as Anne already mentioned, uh, people look at the declining state of populations of species, they look at the changes in the range size, and they assign them a threat category, and the red list index here measures how that category is changing over time. <coughs> and you can see that this, these aren't small data sets, these aren't individual examples of species who, if we shift the baseline, may uh, change their, their population trends. These are, these are very large data sets across very large numbers of species, and they're declining. And an interesting uh, infographic from the ICN um, showing those species that are extinct, uh, dead, those species that are endangered, saying, please help me. And I, I think that I would argue that if we're going to spend our conservation dollar, we need to start acting. We need to stop worrying about how severe this decline is because it's severe. As I mentioned, back in 2010, we failed to significantly reduce the rate of biodiversity loss. Uh, and new goals were formed uh, for 2020, uh, and one of those, the ICI Biodiversity uh, 12, is one of them, the LPI and the Red List Index Measure Progress Team. So the Global Biodiversity Outlook 4 came out this week, I think, part of the conference of parties, and essentially said, mm, we're not going to meet those targets either. Sorry. Uh, and interestingly, in terms of worrying about baselines, uh, the paper that accompanied uh, that 